of exploration. I might have picked up a couple of lines to along the way, but this is definitely better. And, you know, those that know me know that uh, humility doesn't come naturally, but it's easy. It's easy to be humble in this room full of so many great uh, explorers and, and to have uh, such amazing examples of that here, like uh, like uh, Senator Glenn and, and uh, you know, Scott Carpenter, who, I mean, even when I, I just think about what they did, it just brings, it still brings a lump to my throat in that whole era of such amazing accomplishment that went on through Apollo and landing on the moon, and everything that was happening in parallel with that uh, in the oceans with the died in 1960, that, that same era, and then, and then and Scott Carpenter bridging those two worlds, going on to be, a, to be an, uh, an aquanaut and, and to have such a big role in, in uh, humans, humans in the sea and, and uh, our adaptation and understanding diving so well. I mean, these, these were uh, the guys and the, and the others like them in that, that time period that really were my idols. I didn't care about sports figures. I didn't care about the Beatles. I cared about exploration. Yeah. Yeah. It was such an amazing time, and I was I was such a fan of science fiction, written science fiction, and in, and in movies. And yet here it was bursting out all around us. We were, you know, we were going to space for the first time. We were going to be head, heading to other planetary bodies. We were exploring the oceans, and you know that I, I think that it was expressed earlier that that it's uh, curiosity acted upon what exploration is. And I think there is a moment for, for all of us as explorers where we have to get up and do something about it. We're not content to be observers. There's a moment where we realize, you know, we came here to play. We've got to go out there and look. But for me, the realization was when I was, uh, when I was a teenager and, and I, was, I was so inspired by all this, this stuff around me, I thought, okay, what's the likelihood that I'm going to get to go land on another planet? Not very high, but there's, there's an alien world right here on Earth that's unexplored underneath the surface of the sea. That I can go to. I can learn how to scuba dive. I can go down there and look for myself. And that was the beginning for me, you know, to, to, to go get, get scuba certified and, and just go take a look. And that's what, that's what explorers do. They just want to go take a look. They want to be curious. It's curiosity after them. And so, uh, at, at that time, when I was 14, 15 years old, um, there was a, and this was in Canada, there was a Canadian oceanographer, Joe McGinnis, who's here with us tonight. Who, with, I'm not sure where he is. And uh, he was uh, an inspiration to me, and, and there was an a, a underwater habitat that he had built, uh, and it was on display at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I saw that, and I made some sketches of it, and I wrote him a letter, and I'll be damned if he didn't write me back. And we, I, I asked him, how do you build one of those things at the age of 15? And I did build my own, and I put a mouse in it and set it down in, the, in Chippewa Creek in Ontario. And the mouse did survive. So that was my first deep sea vehicle. I think it went down 15 feet. And, but, but the feeling of empowerment that I got from Dr. McGinnis, that here was a real oceanographer who, who wrote me back and said, you can do this, kid. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't meet Joe until many years later, and we became fast friends, and he's participated on, on a number of my expeditions. And, you know, cut to years and years later, and I was, I was doing um, uh, my first expeditions. I did it for Titanic, and then I went on, and we did, uh, we did Bismarck and so on, and uh, the hydrothermal vents. And there was a point at which I realized that in, in the period of time, the first decade of the 21st century, I made one movie, but I made six expeditions. Yeah. So, highly questionable what was the hobby and what was the, what was the primary vocation at that point. And it's only half, jo half jokingly that I say that I make a movie like Titanic or Avatar once a decade so I can pay for all the other stuff. <laughs> this, this expedition stuff is not cheap. So it was, a, it was a solo dive, but it certainly wasn't a solo effort. There were an awful lot of people involved. And, th and there are uh, a number of the people in the expedition are here tonight, and I don't want to leave anybody out, so I'm just going to 
I'm going to call out their names, and I want them to stand up so that we can applaud their, their contribution. There's Maria Wilhelm, who was actually handling media right from on board the ship. Uh, Bruce Sutton. Uh, okay, stand up, Bruce. He's over there. Uh, Bruce ran the, uh, he managed the American team that put together part of the cell and delivered it to Australia. Uh, Chris Simons, who is our science coordinator, uh, coordinated our various science teams, which is a bit like herding cats. And uh, Joe McGinnis. All right, Joe, here's the moment. You gotta stand up for everybody. They're all scattered all over the place. And um, Kevin Hardy, who built the lander vehicles. Kevin is obviously got a big fan club. He was our lander commander. Uh, Doug Bartlett, who was our principal investigator. Microbiologist from Scripps. And Don Walsh himself. I don't know if he went where he went, but, but uh, Don was out there with us. And he's the last person's hand that I shook when I got into the submersible. And uh, one of the first people that I saw coming back, and of course the first thing I did was bring the flag out. And uh, he and I held it up for, for pictures. And what a storied flag that is. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's been from the, the top. It's been to the top of Mount Everest, it's the, the highest place on our planet, it's been to the deepest place on the planet, spanning 65,000 vertical, vertical feet of travel, plenty of horizontal travel in, in between to all sorts of amazing places. And so here I was entrusted with this sacred object, and I took it on the dive, and I, I put it in the only safe place uh, on the sub, which was inside a watertight bag that went underneath the seat. And of course I subsequently got criticized for sitting on the sitting on the flag, but that was, uh, that was the, the, the best place for it. Um, you know, building the sub is, is a story in and of itself, and of course, the, 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 the accomplishment, I think, was not, it's not like climbing Mount Everest or rowing around the world. You look at that kind of thing and, and you, you, you just marvel at, the, at the, the, the human physicality, the endurance, the willpower, all that sort of thing. I mean, I just had to kind of sit in one place for six hours and not move around too much. Uh, so it wasn't that kind of accomplishment. It was an accomplishment of engineering. It was an accomplishment of imagination. And it was, it was done by a small group of people who had a, a passion and a, and a will to do it. They weren't part of a government program. They weren't highly funded relative to what it takes to create a, a complex submersible vehicle. We were working out of a little commercial space in, uh, in suburban Sydney that was in, in between a, a plumbing supply store on one side and a, and a custom plywood cutting shop on the other. And we just left the roll-up door open and people would walk by. They never dreamed for a second what we were doing. We were kind of hiding in plain sight. But we had good oper op operational security. Everybody, was, everybody had to sign a non-disclosure uh, non agreement that worked on the, on the project. And I even made them sign loyalty oaths, which is something I just made up. <laughs> There's no such thing as a legal, legally binding loyalty oath, but I think it worked. Because when, when Don Walsh showed up, I think he expected to see a place where a sub was going to be. And he showed up on the anniversary of this dive on January 23rd of last year. And the sub was only a few days from completion, and we did the first dive just a few days later. Uh, but it, the, 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 the success of the mission was really, and I'm sure the astronauts can attest to this, it's the success of that team, that team of engineers and the people that, that, that made it happen, that, that stand behind you. And we did something unusual on this project, which was, it was an engineering team put together people that hadn't really worked that much in deep submergence, if at all. I mean, they were people that, for example, did... Uh, 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 lithium batteries for uh, electric buses, uh, people that did robotics, but you know, dry land robotics, things like that. They were from different fields, and I think that, and they were, and they were, they were young and, and uh, had all these great ideas. And you know, from where they stood, they couldn't even see the box. They were so uh, far outside the box. And to and to pull it off, we we did some pretty radical ideas. You know, the idea of a vertical sub that could get down through the water quickly and and had lots of time to spend on the bottom doing the exploration that we, that we came there for. These are, these are ideas that, that were made manifest by this, this little kind of ragtag team. It wasn't a government project, it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't government funded, um, uh, it didn't represent the, the willpower of a, of a sovereign nation. It represented the dreams of people from all over the world, Australia, Tasmania, England, Canada, the United States, uh, China, uh, you know, 
know, the, it was a, a very kind of ragtag team, but, but uh, they all had one thing in common. They could imagine it happening, and they had the will to make it happen. And that's, that's what was wonderful about that. I want to share one more thought because the theme of the evening is sacred places. And, you know, there, there are different ways to interpret what that means. I've uh, made many dives to Titanic. We did three expeditions there and explored the exterior and interior of the ship. Uh, and Titanic is a sacred place. I don't think anybody would argue that. It's a, it's a grave site. It's a, it's a memorial not only for those specific people that died in that tragedy, but I think it's become symbolic of, of all such tragedies and wasted lives, and, and yet the nobility of, of people willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may live. And, and you know, Titanic has passed into kind of legendary status, and it, it makes us think about our, our mortality and, and our own values, our own, our own kind of moral courage if we were tested in extremis like that. Uh, Bismarck, a sacred place, uh, you know, a war grave. I think these are, these are true sacred places, but I think there's another kind of sacred place. I think it's a place that makes you, it, it, it's sacred because of the way it makes you feel. It makes you feel like you're in a sacred place. Even if, it, even if from, let's say, the ocean's perspective, it's a mundane piece of sea floor, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, say, for example, at the bottom of the Challenger Deep, you know, but I feel I'm in the presence of something amazing, something wondrous, you know, the, the, the uh, eternal processes that you see down there, the sense of great time, uh, the sense of the vastness of all that we don't understand just outside uh, the, the, the reach of our feeble lights when we're down in such a vast and, and unknown place. So I think, it, I think that's something that we all as explorers seek. I think we, we seek that place that maybe other, other people have experienced but you haven't, or maybe nobody's ever experienced it. Nobody's ever been there and born witness to that specific place, that specific thing, that specific animal, that specific habitat uh, ever before. And that's what we all see, you know, to get, to get away from the, the comfort of our own, uh, you know, human presence and kind of stare the universe in the, in the face and bring back something that, that, uh, that changes us and something that we can hold on to. Uh, I, I think that's what we're all seeking. You know, so, you know, this, this medal, uh, you know, it represents all that to me. It represents all of this great exploration community. Uh, and, and I would just encourage you all to just keep doing what you're doing and, and share your passion, your enthusiasm, your curiosity with the next generation. Thank you.